on our anniversary. My girlfriend Elizabeth posted on social media, time flies, it's already the ninth year, I liked the post, but it was deleted almost immediately, later, by accident, I saw her phone, a friend had commented on that post, it's been nine years, and you still haven't forgotten him, I glanced at his photo, it looked about 90% like me, as it turned out, the ninth year she was commemorating was never about me, it was always her unforgettable first love, Marco, after that, I silently walked away. It wasn't until I was about to get married that I learned my girlfriend had been frantically searching for me for 10 years. Chapter 1 It was the ninth anniversary of my relationship with my girlfriend. As usual, I made a restaurant reservation, prepared roses, and bought her an expensive necklace. Halfway through the meal, she hurried out to take a call. When she came back, she said, there's an urgent matter at the office, I have to go. And she left. I was left alone with steaks, pasta, and desserts. Not wanting it to go to waste, I called a friend to join me. Seeing my unhappy expression, Alex consoled me. Don't be upset. Elizabeth was just promoted to regional general manager, so it's normal for her to be busy. Look, even though she's swamped, she still found time to post about your ninth anniversary on social media. I checked my phone, and sure enough, Elizabeth had updated her status three minutes ago. Time flies. It's already the ninth year. I felt a surge of warmth and liked the post, just as I was about to comment. Where did you find this photo? I don't even remember taking it. The post disappeared. At that moment, Alex asked, puzzled. When did you take this photo? It looks like you, but not quite. I can't put my finger on it. He handed me his phone, showing a screenshot of Elizabeth's post. At first glance, it did look like me. But upon closer inspection, the man in the photo had a softness and fragility in his eyes. My own eyes, on the other hand, were often described as having a resolute sharpness. A quality honed through a decade of professional battles. This unwavering determination had made me invincible in my career. I zoomed in on the photo, noticing a rose tattoo on the man's right index finger. I glanced at my own hand, which was bare. A chill ran down my spine. I asked Alex to send me the screenshot. After saving it, I dialed Elizabeth's number. It rang for a long time, but no one answered. I called again, with the same result. Seeing my tense expression, Alex helped me up and said, I'll take you home. We drove back to my place, rain pouring down outside. Amid the sound of the storm, I stared at the screenshot on my phone, lost in thought. He wasn't me, but he looked so much like me. Or perhaps, I looked so much like him. Just as I was about to call Elizabeth again, the door opened. Elizabeth stumbled in, drenched from head to toe. Chapter 2, You're Back. I asked lightly, sitting on the sofa in the darkened room. My fingers gripping the phone were starting to ache from the pressure. I tried to keep my tone neutral as I asked the question that had been burning in my mind, at the very least, until I knew the truth, I didn't want to come off as unreasonable, but Elizabeth just mumbled a yeah and hurried into the bathroom, the sound of running water echoed from inside, for the first time, I picked up Elizabeth's phone, I opened WeChat, the post was still there, it had only been hidden from me, below that post were comments from Elizabeth's friends, OMG, Marco's back, this post is hidden from your boyfriend, right, no way. Elizabeth, it's been nine years, and you still haven't forgotten him. Underneath that comment, Elizabeth had simply replied with one word, yes, that single word dropped like a thousand pound weight, smashing my heart to pieces. I suddenly felt so foolish, so incredibly foolish, I've lived thirty years, always honest and straightforward, yet I was being used as a stand-in by the person I shared my bed with. Could I be any more stupid? Were there no signs telling me the truth? Every time I habitually patted her head. Elizabeth would frown, and I never paid attention to it. She'd say it would mess up her hairstyle, and it wouldn't look good anymore. When I always preferred wearing black and gray, she often suggested that I try white. David, you're already so cold in nature. Wearing black and gray only makes you seem colder. White would make you look more youthful. I'm not someone who goes out of my way to please others, but when it came to my partner, I always made an effort to accommodate. So, gradually, my wardrobe filled with more and more white clothes. I didn't think there was anything wrong with making my partner happy. After all, when I liked women who wore dresses, Elizabeth would change into a dress after work, sit on my lap, and say, David, come sit. That kind of seductive restraint often kept me in bed until the morning, but now that I think about it, those moments only happened when I was dressed in white. I used to think it was just Elizabeth's aesthetic preference. Now I know, it was her nine-year obsession with a man. That man's name was Marco. Looking at the men in the photo, with the same hairstyle and wearing the same white shirt as me, I never imagined that one day, I'd find myself living the plot of a childhood sweetheart stand-in story. My heart ached, as I pressed my hand against my chest, there was a click as the door opened, and Elizabeth came out. Chapter 3, Who Is He? 
I asked, pointing to the screenshot on my phone. Elizabeth froze for a moment. She didn't answer right away. Instead, she said, let me get dressed first. I sat calmly on the sofa, waiting for her to change, not into pajamas, but into a new dress. She leaned down, placing her hands on my shoulders. David, trust me, he's just a friend. He just returned to the country and doesn't have many friends. So he asked me to pick him up. Elizabeth didn't even wait for my response before standing up, adjusting her clothes, and grabbing the umbrella from the side table. Then she walked straight toward the door. Elizabeth, I hope you don't regret this. I gritted my teeth and said the words, but Elizabeth only paused for a moment before opening the door and leaving. The rain outside grew heavier. I listened to the sound of her footsteps fading away, and my whole body began to tremble. Even though I was wrapped in thick blankets and wearing warm clothes, I still felt so, so cold. When I took my temperature, it read 40 degrees Celsius. For the first time, I realized that when someone is utterly broken, their body can collapse in an instant. I was dizzy, and my first thought was still of Elizabeth. I sent her a picture of the thermometer. The rain is too heavy. It's hard to get a ride, and I'm guessing you haven't gone far yet. Could you take me to the hospital? This time, Elizabeth replied quickly, but her response was, Stop being dramatic, David. We can talk when I get back. My teeth chattered as I replied, Elizabeth. I'm not being dramatic. I really have a fever. Please, you must come back. But this message floated away like a leaf in the ocean. With no response, I tried to order a car through an app, but as expected, none were available. My own car was in the shop for maintenance. Honestly, even if my car were in the garage right now, how could I risk driving in this condition? I called Alex. Alex stayed with me at the hospital. Should I call Elizabeth? After all, you are still her boyfriend. My lips were pale, and I silently shook my head. But David, are you really planning to break up? Nine years, if it weren't for you. Elizabeth wouldn't have what she has today. Now she's richer, more powerful, and just leaves you behind. Why? Alex gritted his teeth. At least you should get someone to teach her a lesson. It's only fair. I waved my hand and smiled bitterly. How do you wake someone who is pretending to be asleep? The answer is, you can't. I didn't want to drag this out any longer. That's not who I am, David. My heart was shattered into pieces. I had no strength left. Chapter 4 I stayed in the hospital for two days. Elizabeth didn't call or send a single message. It was I who texted her, Elizabeth, we need to talk, David, I've been really busy these days, Marco isn't doing well and needs company, I saw Alex's social media posts, and knowing he's taking care of you makes me feel reassured, just wait a few more days, okay, let me finish my work, wait, there's that word again, when we had been together for four years, I had already discussed marriage with Elizabeth, my parents were urging us, and I, because I loved her, wanted to settle down quickly, what had Elizabeth said back then? David, my career is still unstable, could you wait a little longer? I don't want to hold you back. At that time, I was already in upper management. While Elizabeth had just been promoted to a junior supervisor, I understood the desire of a woman wanting to become strong in front of her men. So, I waited another two years. In our sixth year together, I brought up marriage again. This time, what did Elizabeth say? David, I've just broken into upper management. My position isn't secure yet. If we marry now, People might use it as an excuse to say my family life is affecting my career. I remember feeling upset, but I loved Elizabeth. Love made me give in once again. Later, I found out that Elizabeth made me wait because Marco had made her wait. He told her to wait 10 years. And Elizabeth, for that 10-year promise, made me wait for 9 years. If it hadn't been for her forgetting to block me from that post, without a doubt, Elizabeth would have made me wait the full 10 years. If Marco was willing to fulfill that 10-year dream, she would have tossed me aside. If Marco wasn't, maybe she would have settled for marrying me. No one knew that this whole relationship had been nothing but a charade, but it no longer mattered. Chapter 5 Back at home, I looked at the place where we had lived for nine years. It was full of memories of Elizabeth and me. I started in our bedroom. I began sorting through the clothes that had been with me for so long. The white clothes. I hung them up one by one. The black and gray ones. I took them out, folded them neatly, and placed them in my suitcase. When I finished, I looked at the wardrobe. The left half was filled with Elizabeth's dark clothes, and the right half was her beloved white clothes. I could almost see Elizabeth standing on the left, and Marco standing on the right. This strange vision, I think Elizabeth must have seen it many times too. She had surely imagined living such a life, one half her, and the other half Marco. But how unfortunate, these past nine years, I had been occupying that other half. Elizabeth must have thought about that many, many times. I moved on to the study. I love reading more than Elizabeth because. Aside from being a corporate executive, I'm also a writer. So, most of the books in the study were mine. I ended up packing over a dozen large boxes, 
When the moving company Alex had called came to take my books, the study looked like it had been robbed. Only a few love stories that I never liked were left behind. I picked one up and opened it. There were words on the title page. A gift from Marco. Oh. So that's how it was. Because Marco gave it to her. Elizabeth must have leafed through it countless times. The worn pages made it easy to imagine Elizabeth running her fingers over them, as if she were caressing Marco's body. I laughed at myself and carefully placed those few books back on the shelf. There was no trace of me left on the entire wall. Only Marco remained. Isn't that exactly what Elizabeth wanted? Then, I went to the kitchen. Chapter 6. As I entered the kitchen, I thought about Elizabeth's love for me. I remembered when the pandemic hit, and I said I'd isolate myself elsewhere. Elizabeth stopped me. David. We're partners. It's my responsibility to take care of you. She made me lie down, boiled water, and cooked for me in the middle of the night, when I groggily mumbled. I'm so thirsty. Elizabeth would quickly hand me water. Drink, David. Drink the water, and you'll feel better. During the pandemic, she never let me go out to stock up on supplies. She'd say, David, it's dangerous out there. I'll go. I'm stronger anyway. I stood in the middle of the kitchen, thinking about it over and over. Alex said I looked calm. But he didn't understand that a man's calmness comes from a heart that has died. When the heart dies, there are no more tears to cry. Elizabeth, do you understand? Chapter 7 I sat there, motionless, until evening. I watched as the sun set outside the window, and then the moon rose in its place. And then, I understood, the person I had been waiting for wasn't coming back. Her nine years of longing were far greater than the nine years she had spent settling for me. Goodbye, Elizabeth. I stood up, dragging my suitcase. And as I passed the side table, I saw a photo of Elizabeth and me. There was no trace left of us in this house. I'd leave the photo for her. Whether she tore it up or threw it away, I didn't care. Chapter 8 I accepted an offer from a company in the US and resigned from my old job back home. As the plane took off, I got a call from HR at my former company. Mr. Lou, I think it's important to let you know. MS Lou from the Dakin Group called to ask if you were on a business trip. I'm guessing you haven't told her about your resignation. So I thought I'd check with you. I expressed my gratitude. Just tell her I'm on a business trip. Don't say anything else. After hanging up, I checked my phone. Messages from Elizabeth started pouring in. David, why aren't you answering? Did you get discharged from the hospital? What's going on? Why aren't you telling me? You're not still mad, are you? I told you. He's just a friend. Once this blows over, everything will be fine. After all, he just went through a breakup. And we're old classmates. David, you're a senior executive at a public company. Don't be so petty. Okay. Oh, I just spoke to your company. Shaoli said you're on a business trip, so I assume you're better now. That makes me feel much better. Have a good trip, and we'll talk when you get back. Love you. Looking at these messages, they felt like they were from a past life. More accurately, it felt like these messages were sent to the wrong person. Like Elizabeth had chosen the wrong recipient. So, I deleted them all in one go. Then, I turned off my phone and boarded the plane. Chapter 9. After landing. I tossed my old phone in a drawer and started using the new one provided by the company. I was busy house hunting, getting to know the new team, so busy that my feet barely touched the ground. The company in the US had approached me a while ago, offering a salary three times what I was making back home. At the time, I declined, thinking life abroad would be too difficult. I never expected them to keep pursuing me. Now that I was here, it felt like a perfect match. For a moment, I felt a bit relieved that Elizabeth had chosen her childhood sweetheart over me. In just three days, I had settled into my new routine. Only then did I have a moment to breathe and pull out my old phone from the drawer. It had many photos I couldn't bring myself to delete. I planned to delete all the ones of Elizabeth, but as for my own selfies, I wasn't willing to part with any of those. As soon as I turned it on, thousands of messages from Elizabeth flooded in, nearly crashing the phone. David, what's the meaning of this? What happened to the books in the study? And what about the clothes in the closet? Weren't you just on a business trip? Answer me, David. There's really nothing between Marco and me. I admit we were together in the past, but that's history now. My heart belongs to you, David. When are you coming back? Just give me a sign, even if it's just one word, so I know you're still there. Okay. Please stop being mad. I'm begging you. I gripped my phone tightly. My parents came over and patted my shoulder. When I moved to the U.S., the company had agreed to help my parents get a family reunification visa. So, they had come with me. Other than them, the only person who knew where I had gone was Alex but he had blocked and deleted all of Elizabeth's contact information and moved to Scandinavia for work. I, on the other hand, hadn't had the time to delete Elizabeth's messages because I'd been so busy after landing, but it didn't matter anymore. I pulled out the SIM card, as I was about to delete WeChat. My finger slipped and opened another app instead. I clicked into it, and to my surprise, 
It was the security camera system from when Elizabeth and I had lived together. My parents had gone out for a walk, leaving me alone on the couch. It was a rare moment of rest, so I grabbed a big bag of chips, opened it, and started watching the security footage. The first video was a playback from three days ago. I thought for a moment, it was the day I had just landed in the US. The same day Elizabeth had called my former company, and I had told HR to say I was on a business trip. Seeing that house on video again felt like a lifetime ago. For a brief moment, I questioned whether this was really the home I had shared with a woman for nine years. There was no trace of me left in that place, except for the photo of Elizabeth and me that I had left on the side table. Soon, the quiet house was interrupted by the sound of the door's passcode being entered. The face that appeared was all too familiar, Elizabeth. She looked stunning in a dress, like the kind of beautiful female lead in a drama who seems to glow. I stuffed a handful of chips into my mouth. So delicious. Chips are a must-have for any good show. Then, someone else entered, wearing a white shirt and sporting the same hairstyle as me. Yes, it was Marco. I took a sip of cola. He was probably the new man of the house now. Right. He really was handsome. When Elizabeth bought this house, the man she imagined living here with her was undoubtedly Marco. I looked at Marco closely. His eyes held a certain fragility that even stirred a protective instinct in me, as a fellow man, unlike me, who always got things done swiftly and decisively. Everyone said my gaze was sharp, able to defeat a thousand enemies in the business world. What a joke. How else could I have become the youngest regional executive manager? I stuffed another handful of chips into my mouth, tomato flavored, my favorite. Under the bright lights, Elizabeth led Marco into the living room. David's on a business trip for a few days. I told him you're going through a rough time after your breakup and needed company. Stay here for a few days. He'll understand. Elizabeth sat Marco on the couch and poured him a glass of water. He didn't take it. Instead, his hand slid around Elizabeth's neck. I thought all these years, you were just using him as a stand-in for me. I stopped chewing my chips for a second. Marco, that's all in the past. The person I love now is David. She pulled out some pills. Take your medicine and go to bed. But Marco grabbed Elizabeth and pulled her onto his lap. Elizabeth, you're doing this on purpose to provoke me, aren't you? You expect me to believe you haven't thought about me all these years. Otherwise, how could you be willing to spend time with me instead of him? Marco. Elizabeth's voice was hoarse. Don't do this. She said softly. I had to give it to myself for installing that security system. The audio quality was incredible. Don't do what? Elizabeth. I like you. And I know you like me too. Otherwise, why would you have chosen him? A man who looks exactly like me. Marco began taking off his shirt, revealing his well-built body under the light. Elizabeth couldn't hold back anymore. And their heavy breathing intertwined. This live drama was way more exciting than anything on TV. I glanced at the door, checking to see if my parents were back. Nope. Still out. Turns out, when women play coy, it never lasts more than three seconds. The two of them were passionately spinning around. I thought they'd head for the bedroom, but instead, they stumbled into the study. Just as Marco was about to lay Elizabeth on the desk, she froze, completely still. Marco's hands were still exploring her body, but Elizabeth suddenly pushed him away. She walked through the living room and headed to the bedroom, flinging the wardrobe doors open. The wardrobe built into the wall, half of it was empty. Elizabeth approached it, reaching in to grab a piece of clothing. White. She threw it on the bed, then grabbed another one. Again white. She tossed it onto the bed. She pulled out one piece after another, but they were all white. Elizabeth looked as if she had seen a ghost, yet she kept pulling clothes from the wardrobe. Finally, she threw everything onto the bed. David, what have you done? In the footage, her voice was frantic. Her face flushed. I could almost feel the necklace around her neck tightening like it was choking her. She stormed into the living room, ignoring Marco's calls. Elizabeth, what's wrong? But Elizabeth only cared about grabbing her phone from the coffee table. Her first message was a voice recording. David, what's the meaning of this? What happened to the books in the study? And what about the clothes in the closet? You said you were just on a business trip. Answer me. Realizing that sending a voice message wasn't right, she started typing instead. I recalled seeing those messages earlier, Elizabeth must have sent them at this very moment. I got up and grabbed another bag of chips. Let me tell you, when watching a show, chips are the best snack. No contest. I opened the bag and continued watching. Chapter 10. David. There's really nothing between Marco and me. I admit we were together in the past. But that's history now. My heart belongs to you, Elizabeth. Marco couldn't stay silent any longer after hearing her words. Are you sure we're just history? If we're in the past. Why did you come to pick me up the moment I returned to the country? Why did you post time flies? It's already the ninth year. When someone asked if you still couldn't forget me, you replied with, yes, Elizabeth. Look at your own words, what part of them is true? Elizabeth slumped onto the sofa, 
As if she hadn't heard a word Marco said, I watched as she tried to call me, but all she got was, the number you have dialed is currently switched off. Seeing her say nothing, Marco, instead of pushing further, gently walked over to the sofa, standing behind Elizabeth and reaching out, trying to comfort her, but all he got in return was Elizabeth's cold response, you should leave, I'll call a car to take you back to your hotel. Marco froze, Elizabeth, do you even know what time it is? You're kicking me out at 2 in the morning. Elizabeth pushed Marco's hand away and stood up. She tapped a few buttons on her phone. The car is on its way. You have plenty of classmates in this country. Go find one of them to stay with. Elizabeth, don't you understand that I'm emotionally unstable after my breakup? Sure, I have friends, but I trust you the most. I didn't just come back to visit family. I wanted to start over with you. Elizabeth, when you posted that photo of David, I knew you hadn't forgotten me. You need to realize your true feelings. We shouldn't keep missing each other. Marco, Elizabeth suddenly deflated, like a balloon losing air, please go, I can't lose David, he looks like you, but he's not you, and you're not him, his eyes don't have your fragility, they're full of determination, I've grown tired of your weakness and fragility, I don't want to lose David, Marco didn't move, but Elizabeth got up, dragged his suitcase to the door, and opened it, David got my message, he'll be back soon, I don't want him to see you, Marco hesitated for a moment, but seeing Elizabeth's cold expression, he finally gave in, Reluctantly pulling his suitcase out the door, Elizabeth closed the door behind him, and after looking around the room, she sat down on the sofa, holding the last thing I'd left in that house, our photo, and spent the entire night there, watching her sitting there, so alone, I couldn't help but open another bottle of cola, no matter what drama you're watching, besides chips, there's one thing you should always have, popcorn, unfortunately, I didn't have any in my villa, so, I opened another bag of chips, after all, the show wasn't over yet, Chapter 11. Elizabeth sat on that sofa all night, only getting up when she received a call from her secretary in the morning. When she returned home that night, she hadn't even changed her clothes. She just sat down on the sofa again. Out of habit, she sent me a voice message. I went to your company today. I told them if they didn't tell me where you were, I'd pull out of all our business deals. That's when I found out you didn't just go on a business trip, you resigned. But no matter how much I asked, they wouldn't tell me where you went. David. I'm guessing you went away to clear your head. When are you coming back? Can you send me a message? Even just one word. So I know you're still out there. Okay. Please don't be mad anymore. I'm begging you. David. I'm really worried about you. When you said you had a fever. I should have taken you to the hospital. That's my fault. But Marco told me he was heartbroken and didn't know who else to turn to. So I went to take care of him. I was only with him because I knew you'd be okay. Can you forgive me? I stopped chewing my chips for a moment because I realized something, whether or not I forgave her didn't matter. What mattered was the one thought that echoed in my head. Elizabeth, do you even deserve it? Elizabeth continued sitting on the sofa, watching her phone. Each time it made a noise, she would check it. There were plenty of work-related messages, and many more from Marco, but Elizabeth just seemed irritated. She placed the phone face down on the coffee table and got up, walking into the kitchen. After standing there for a while, she seemed to realize she was hungry. So she opened the fridge. Chapter 12. When Elizabeth opened the fridge, her expression changed instantly. Cautiously, she pulled out what she had found inside. It was a sea blue cake, topped with whipped cream shaped like white waves. The cake wasn't fresh anymore, but she remembered very clearly a significant promise she had made with David. For that promise, they had even sketched a design together. A sketch she had carefully framed and placed in her office. She often fantasized about having a child with David, one who would have the same determined gaze as him. Someone decisive and efficient, but then she thought about Marco, who looked exactly like David. The moment she saw David, she had nearly burst into tears. She and her childhood sweetheart Marco had made a pact, a ten-year promise. If Marco hadn't married by then, she would marry him, but Marco had been abroad, and they hadn't kept in touch. Elizabeth had spent many nights missing Marco, but it was David who had gotten her through them. She had dressed David in the white shirts Marco loved, had him cut his hair the way Marco liked, back then. David had looked so much like Marco, but later, Elizabeth realized more and more that David was simply David, not at all like Marco, who was easily broken and fragile, giving in quickly and leaving everything behind to go abroad. By the time the pandemic hit, Elizabeth no longer cared whether David wore white or cut his hair a certain way. In those years, David grew his hair out and wore his black bear pajamas at home. She saw that behind David's determination was a unique dependence on her. From that moment, she began to yearn for a child with David. She wanted to start a family and embark on the next journey of life with him. On their ninth anniversary, she had planned to propose to him. But then, Marco had called. He told her he had just gone through a breakup and didn't want to live anymore. Elizabeth, maybe you can still save me. 
She hadn't wanted to tell David that Marco was an ex, fearing it would upset him, but she also didn't want Marco to actually die, so she lied about being busy with work and put the proposal on hold. During those days at the hotel, Elizabeth had booked a double room, sleeping in the bed next to Marco. Those nights, Marco would wake up in the middle of the night saying he wanted to die. She couldn't bear to leave him, but eventually, she realized that avoiding David wasn't a solution, so she decided to bring Marco home. If David could see everything happening under his own roof, maybe he wouldn't be so angry. What Elizabeth didn't expect was that by the time she returned, David had already left. She sensed the crisis, not just a temporary loss, but an eternal departure. She panicked. She admitted that, facing Marco's advances, she had almost made a terrible mistake, but looking at the empty study in the half-empty wardrobe, she realized she was about to lose the most important part of her life. That was nine years of love carved into the timeline of her life. She knew their love hadn't been pure at the start, but over time, that love had been polished into a brilliant gem. She had pushed Marco away. Feeling herself sinking into an abyss, she sent David countless voice messages, texts, and made numerous calls. David hadn't blocked her on any platform, and that was scarier than blocking her. It proved that David didn't care anymore. He didn't care if she was with Marco, didn't care if she knelt down to beg him to stay, didn't care if she even remembered him at all. He had given up. Elizabeth couldn't understand. She spent night after night sitting in that house, watching the sky brighten and then darken again. Between the light and darkness, she couldn't grasp why simply spending a few days with Marco had caused David to give up on her so completely. And now she was hungry. She hadn't eaten or slept for days, and her stomach was telling her she needed something, or she would die. She didn't want to die yet. She desperately wanted to say something to David. Even if all he gave her was a single word, even if it was just go away, she would take that as hope. Elizabeth opened the fridge, and there it was, the sea blue cake. If we ever have a child, the moment we find out, we'll make a cake together. Okay. Elizabeth. How about a sea blue cake? David was so creative. He quickly sketched out a design on a small 7-inch card. Perfect. David said as he added a few final strokes. Our child should be like the ocean, born free, living wide, with endless possibilities. David had said with longing. That night, she and David had stayed together until dawn. The two of them shared the hope of a new life, and it was that same night that she had been preparing to propose. But now, without her involvement, that sea blue cake symbolizing their child had suddenly appeared in the fridge. As Elizabeth took it out, her whole body trembled. She sent another message to David. David, you don't know how much I wanted to have a child with you. Please, let's get married and do all the things we promised each other. Please? Please, David, even if all you say is go away, I'll feel better than I do right now. She sent many, many messages all of them disappearing into the void. Elizabeth knew David's character, making this cake was his way of closing the chapter on their dream of having a child together. She remembered the rainy night when David had asked her to take him to the hospital with a fever. She thought about the afternoon when David had messaged her, asking to talk. As these thoughts swirled, Elizabeth suddenly slapped herself twice. Hard. Blood trickled from the corner of her mouth. She wiped it away. It didn't hurt. But then she felt like she was burning up with fever, her teeth chattering uncontrollably. She stared at the sea blue cake, but she didn't feel the freedom of the ocean or the vastness of the sea. She only felt like an executioner, someone who had killed the child she and David had so deeply longed for. The woman who had become so accustomed to being called, President Zhang, now sat at the dining table, looking like a frail old woman. She stared blankly at the sea blue cake, like a withered piece of dead wood. Then, suddenly, she saw a note under the cake. She slowly pulled it out, and on it were David's firm, familiar words, no matter what happens. Elizabeth, when you see this cake, please light a candle for the child we never had. After reading David's message, Elizabeth's eyes stung. She reached up to wipe her tears, but the more she wiped, the more tears fell, streaming through her fingers. She couldn't stop crying, so she tried to clench her teeth and hold back the sobs, but eventually, she couldn't suppress it any longer, and she cried aloud. She sobbed loudly, but the room was empty. The men named David would never hold her again. Once, when she had struggled in her career, it was David who had held her through those painful nights. Later, he had supported her career, helping her soar to greater heights. And on the nights when she had cried with joy over her professional success, it had been David who first embraced her and called her the most perfect woman in the world. She had been so happy to know she was so perfect in David's eyes. But now, she had ruined everything. She kept crying until she had no strength left. The cake on the table mocked her, reminding her of all her foolishness and hypocrisy. She found a lighter and lit a candle, placing it on the cake. After the flame had completely burned out, Elizabeth reached out and began shoving handfuls of the cake into her mouth. The cake was stale, the cream tasting like wax, revolting. 
but Elizabeth kept forcing handfuls of cake into her mouth. As she finished, her stomach churned, and she vomited it all back up. Then, a warm sensation rose in her throat, and she collapsed. Chapter 13 David had turned off the video as soon as he saw Elizabeth lose control and eat the cake. After watching her light a candle for the child they never had, he lost what little interest he had left in her. Her tears, the blood at the corner of her mouth, and the swelling on her face from her own slaps all made David feel she was getting exactly what she deserved. He closed the video, turned off the phone, and tossed it back into the drawer where it belonged. Then he went to take a nap in the master bedroom. He didn't believe for a second that a woman like Elizabeth would truly take responsibility for her actions. She was young, rich, and stunningly beautiful. After a few days of madness, she would likely feel better. A few more nights of drinking, and soon enough, she'd be bringing different men home. Maybe Elizabeth, who had always been drawn to substitute romances, would find another man who looked just like David, it wouldn't surprise him. With that thought, David drifted off to sleep. When he woke up, he got back to writing. The fresh environment had sparked new inspiration in him. As his fingers tapped the keys, the words began to flow like a fountain. A sense of flow hit him, a powerful feeling of being fully immersed in his work. Meanwhile, Elizabeth lay in a hospital bed. Even she couldn't believe that she had vomited blood out of sheer heartbreak. It turned out that extreme emotional pain could truly make a person physically ill. Once again, she thought of David. Could it be possible that if she reached out to him sincerely, he might be moved? Could they reconcile? Was it possible that all of this was just a harsh test from David? Clinging to this belief, Elizabeth became obsessed with finding David after she was discharged from the hospital. But she hadn't expected that David's parents had blocked her on every platform and their house was empty. Maybe David had been planning to disappear completely for a while now, because none of the neighbors had any idea where the Lou family had gone. As for his other relatives, she didn't have their contact information. The one person who might have known, Alex, had already left for Scandinavia, and he had been the first to delete all of his contact details for David. Elizabeth's last hope was David's former company, but no matter how much she harassed them, the only response she got was that Mr. Lou had resigned to take a break, and they had no further information because of her repeated visits to the company. The shareholders believed she was damaging the company's image and removed her from her position as Greater China Executive Director. Her reputation and income took a sharp nosedive. A lot of her connections disappeared overnight. Even the people who had once flattered her daily vanished without a trace. But Elizabeth didn't care. She handed over large sums of money to various detective agencies, asking them to help find David. In the end, they all came back with the same answer. David wasn't in the country. So, where had he gone? Elizabeth seemed to lose her mind. Every day, she was either searching for clues about David's whereabouts or drinking her sorrows away in bars. Marco, to his credit, showed up to see her daily. He even suggested, if you once chose David because he looked like me, why can't you now treat me like him? Elizabeth cursed him, disgusting. But deep down, she knew the truth, the only disgusting person here was herself. She spiraled, flipping her days and nights upside down, until she finally sold the house she had once shared with David. She moved into a small apartment. She didn't want the constant reminder that the house had been where she had destroyed everything. Her David, the men she had been planning to propose to, and the child she had dreamed of for so long, the child who would have been as determined as David, all of that was gone. Eventually, she got wind of a rumor that David was in the United States. At first, she didn't believe it. David had always said, as long as my parents are alive, I won't travel far. He wouldn't leave the country. But when Elizabeth saw a book written by David, she finally understood why she had been unable to find him. David had entered a secretive industry. For the sake of his career, he had cut ties with all social platforms. It was a requirement of the corporate confidentiality agreement. Had it not been for David publishing his book in the U.S., her chances of finding him would have been almost non-existent. By this time, ten full years had passed since she lost David. Finally, she saw David again, but it was on the pages of his book. After years of maturation, David's eyes were more determined and captivating than ever. In that moment, Elizabeth felt a rush of emotion. She took a long, thorough shower in her apartment, then went to a hair salon. Her body had remained in great shape, and when she entered, she had looked like a disheveled, drunken woman. But after some pampering, she returned to the image of the young, beautiful, and wealthy woman she had been at 30. This beautiful body was truly a gift from above for Elizabeth. After so many years of not dating, her friends had told her she was wasting her looks, and in truth, Elizabeth herself didn't understand why. After David left, her heart had latched onto him so completely. Her one obsession in this lifetime had become seeing David one more time, to tell him that she still loved him, to confess her mistakes, to declare her love openly. On the flight to the U.S., she reread David's book again. 
She latched onto one crucial piece of information. David was still unmarried. Maybe all these years, David had been waiting for her. Waiting for her to join him. So they could have the free-spirited child they had once dreamed of. Filled with excitement, Elizabeth rented a car upon arriving in the US and drove to David's residence. Chapter 14. She knocked on the door, but the person who opened it was an American woman. When Elizabeth asked about David in English, the woman replied, Today is David's wedding day. It's at church number three. I'm just here to grab the rings for him. He's so nervous that he forgot them. If you're having trouble finding the place, you can come with me. Hurriedly, the woman shut the door of the villa, and they crossed the green lawn, heading to the main road. More people began to emerge from the surrounding villas. They're all going to David's wedding. The woman smiled. Walking quickly, Elizabeth tried to keep pace, feeling her body swaying with each step. When they reached the entrance of the church, she hesitated, unable to take a step forward. You look even more nervous than the groom. The woman invited her inside enthusiastically. You must be a friend of David's. Right. You should congratulate him. He and the bride have been together for nine years. In Chinese culture, doesn't the number nine symbolize something lasting? The woman opened the church doors, but Elizabeth remained standing outside. From David's point of view, he first saw his friends, and then, at the entrance of the church, he noticed a vaguely familiar figure. He didn't think much of it, weaving through the crowd to retrieve the rings his friend had brought. Once he had the rings, he immediately turned his attention back to his bride, Min, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, was both extraordinarily talented and beautiful. The smile David gave his bride was full of happiness, this was the woman who had waited for him for nine years. All because he had insisted they marry the year the chaos was published, and Min had agreed. She had said, it's so romantic, nine symbolizes eternity. Honey, Chinese culture is truly profound. When David took the rings and prepared to go on stage, he finally recognized the figure standing at the church's entrance. It was Elizabeth. David thought she must be a tourist who had accidentally stumbled upon his wedding. She was a fellow countrywoman, so he instinctively offered her a polite smile. Then he turned back to the ceremony. Elizabeth didn't witness the grand reunion scene she had imagined, a tearful embrace and reconciliation. Instead, David's polite smile pierced her deeply. This journey had been solely for David. Every strand of hair she cut, every inch of skin she had meticulously cared for during her shower. Every second she had spent anxiously choosing her outfit, and the whirlwind of emotions she had experienced on the flight, all had revolved around David. What she hadn't expected was that David had started a new relationship the year after they had parted. There had been no lingering feelings, no desire to have the child they had once dreamed of. Elizabeth was nothing more than a person from his past. And David, just like his determined eyes, had moved forward in his life without looking back. As the wedding march began to play, Elizabeth stood there watching as David and the stunning woman beside him exchanged their vows. The priest, do you, the groom, take the bride to be your wife? The groom, yes, I do. The priest, no matter if she is rich or poor, in health or sickness, do you vow to stay with her forever? The groom, yes, I do. The priest turned to the bride. The priest, do you, the bride, take the groom to be your husband? The bride, yes, I do. The priest, no matter if he is rich or poor, in health or sickness, do you vow to stay with him forever? The bride, yes, I do. The priest, well then, by the power vested in me by the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. No one noticed when, as the happy couple kissed, a woman named Elizabeth quietly left the church, wearing her expensive high heels. She walked with despair, heading towards a blue ocean. White waves crashed against the shore, reminiscent of the memories she had stubbornly clung to. She removed her shoes placing them neatly aside, and slowly walked into the water, step by step, David, maybe in another world, we'll have the chance to meet again, where we'll marry, have children, and grow old together, I know everything that has happened is my own karma, but I still won't wish you happiness, because my love has ended with you, three days later, in a place called Massachusetts, a body was found washed up on the shore, but the newlywed David had no idea, after all, the ocean had carried the body far from him, more importantly, he was now immersed in his new life of happiness. The past had long been forgotten, as he cherished the present, because only the present is eternal.